I had a mate years ago who had a girlfriend who he really, really loved, cared about and cherished. And he wanted to spend the rest of his life with her, marry her and have a family with her. But he did something stupid one day and had an affair. And because he loved his girlfriend, he told the truth and his girlfriend left him and never spoke to him again. Fair enough. Fair enough, isn't it? But he was devastated at this. And I remember talking to him once and he was saying to me, Shane, I've thrown it all away. I've thrown this happy life I was going to have with this girl that I loved and have a family with and have kids with. I've thrown it all away for a night of madness. Now, when I was thinking that story through, which happened a few years ago, and I was thinking it through with this sermon, I was thinking, wow, I've had things in my life which I've just thrown away, which have really blessed me and blessed others. I've had opportunities in which I've just thrown away. And maybe you feel the same. Maybe you've had some regrets where you feel you've just thrown opportunities away. Now, many of us here are Christians. And we're all in a privileged position. Uh, but we can still throw away the biggest thing in our lives. And I want to look at Psalm 95 to show that. But first of all, let me pray. Lord, we praise you and thank you, Lord, and we worship you today through your word. And we pray that you open up our hearts and minds to your word, Lord Jesus. I pray you strengthen us to worship you, keep our hearts from being hardened, and keep us loving you, cherishing you, and honouring you, Lord. Help us to love one another as well, Lord, and help us not to throw anything away, Lord Jesus, but help us to be looking to you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So we're in Psalm 95, and we're going to start at verse 1. I usually do read the psalm out, but I want to leave this as a bit of surprise, so I won't read it out. I've just given away it may be a surprise now, but verse 1. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. The psalmist starts off this song, a psalm, in a happy way. He's saying, come everyone, come to God, who are God's people, come and let us worship the Lord together. The rock of our salvation. And you see here it says, shout aloud. In the ESV or the net, I can't think, I think it might be both. It says joyful noise. Come, let us make a joyful noise to God. Here the psalmist starts off the psalm by saying, let's have a party to God. Come all God's people and worship him and let's have a party to the rock of our salvation. Making joyful noises. Now some of us, many of us, and maybe all of us, have had experiences of parties in one degree or another. Some of us have had negative experiences of noise keeping us up all night. Others of us have had positive experiences of parties where we've had a happy and joyous time singing and dancing. What the psalmist is starting off this psalm is saying, come, let's have a party for God, the rock of our salvation, and make a joyful noise. This is very un-British, is it not? This is very un-British, is it not? Because in our, because what the psalmist is saying is that come, joyful noise, singing, shouting aloud, worshiping with our whole bodies, minds, and hearts. This idea of a party and a rave, but doing that in church is a very un-British thing to us. And even now, we think to ourselves, maybe, oh, I couldn't worship God like that. I don't want to shout too much, other people might look at me. Other people might say things about me. But here we see the psalmist is saying, come everyone and let's make a joyful noise, shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Now let's have a look at the next verse to see how he opens it up more. Let us come before him with what? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. Here we're seeing the party atmosphere get bigger, extolling him with music and song, worshipping him with music and song, making a joyful noise, shouting aloud to the God of our salvation, the rock of our salvation. This is a part in the atmosphere the psalmist is going on about. But he's adding another facet, another shade to worshipping God. Thanksgiving. 
So he's not only saying, come and make a joyful noise and have a happy dance and with music and song and sing aloud to him, but he's also saying, come to God with thanksgiving. Did you know that thanksgiving is a major part of worship? I didn't. I kind of knew that you had to thank God, but I don't really, when I come to worship God with the church or as an individual, thank God that really, that much, really. When I was younger, my mother taught me to always say thank you to people who were nice to me, who had given me stuff. It's the polite thing to do, who had served me in some way, who had given me hospitality. So if we do that to one another and thank each other for that, how much more should we thank the God of the universe who created us, who gave us breath and life, has given us Fred. He's given, <laughs> he's given us everything we could. He's given us a lot of things like houses and cars and also given us his son, Jesus. How much more should we come to worship God in thanksgiving and thank God for what he has done for us? And if you only think like me, I don't thank God that much. And I wonder in our worship today, do we thank God? Have we thanked God this week and come to him with thanksgiving? So, so far we have seen this. The psalmist starts this off in a boyish mood, in a joyous mood, saying let's have a party and come with joyful noise to God. Let's come with thanksgiving and make music and song to him. Let's come and worship God. And now the psalmist is going to open it up more to see why we should do this. So verse 3. I'll just get a little drink. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all, what? Gods. Now this is interesting. We know that there's only one God in the Bible, the living God, the true God, yeah? And the Bible says that. So who are these other gods that God is meant to be King above all these other gods? Because we know that there's only one true living God. Well, back in ancient times, they used to make gods of images, like gods of things, like human beings used to make gods, like images to the trees and to the sea and to the water and to the wind and to the waves and to the fertility. And they used to worship these things as gods. So they'd worship the god of the land, the air, the sea, the god of fertility. And what this psalmist is saying here, the true living God is king above these gods because he is a great king. And that's not only an ancient problem, that is a problem for all of us here today as human beings. Because we make gods out of our own hands. We might not fashion them with metal and wood, but we fashion them in our hearts. We make gods of all sorts of things, fame and fortune, sex and pleasure, maybe even family and friends, maybe even work. All these things can be gods to us, and they can give us pleasure at times. But what we see here is that the living God of the Bible is the true God above all these. And have you ever experienced this? Is that when you worship these other gods that you've made of yourself, doesn't it affect your worship of the true living God? You feel more null and void towards the true living God. Which is a bit dumb really. It's because this God is God above all gods and he's the great king of the universe. And when we fashion gods for ourselves, it harms our worship to this true and living God who calls us to make a joyful noise to him and, mu and make music and song to him. Now the psalmist is going to open it up more in the rest of the song. So let's have a look. Verse 4, were you all there? In his hands are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Now the psalmist goes on to show why this king is king above all the other gods. Because he is God of the lowest part of the universe, of the earth, to the highest peak. 
mountain. That's what it's saying. He is God everywhere. No matter where you go in creation, whether it's to the deepest hole in the world or to outer space, God is there because he created it. And you can't get away from him. From the lowest low to the highest high, God is creator. Another thing he says is that he formed the sea and the land. Have you ever been next to the sea? I'm sure many of you have. I was in Brighton the other week and I looked at the sea and it was mighty and awesome. It was quite a rainy day as well, so you saw the waves bouncing around like that and it was humongous, it was vast. And I was thinking to myself, why, if I went out there, not in a boat or a life jacket, I would just be swallowed whole. This God is a king of all gods because he created this sea. And it was just nothing for him to create. And not only that, he created the land as well. Doesn't this stir your hearts to worship God? When you see that this God is the king above other gods and he calls us to a joyful noise to worship him, honour him and love him with music and song. Have you ever been in Richmond Park, which I'm sure you have, or any other park like that, on an early winter's morning and seen the mist come up from the grass and seen the beauty of it and seen all the birds and the trees and the deer and now I look at that and I think, wow, God created all this. And that stirs my heart to worship God. And this is what the psalmist is trying to do to his people, to the congregation he's writing to, and also to us today, to stir our hearts to worship God. So we want to come in joyful song and noise to him. And he points to how God is the king of kings, king above all the gods that we fashion in our lives. Now let's carry on and see what else the psalmist talks about. Verse 6. Come. So he's telling everyone to come again. The congregation to come. The church to come. God's people to come. Let us... What? Bow down. Bow down. This is interesting. In worship, let us kneel down. kneel down before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God. So he's saying again, the psalmist, come everyone. And not only are we going to make joyful news, uh, noise and music to God and have a party. And not only are we going to be our hearts stirred by this king of the universe who created everything. But let's come to this God and bow down and kneel down to him. In the Lord of the Rings trilogy, it's a film. The last film was called Return of the King. <laughs> That's in case none of you knew it was a film, right? The last film was The Return of the King, right? And there's a character called Aragorn in it. And he returns to his kingdom. Uh, it's Gondor. I believe it's Gondor. I, I'm 100% right, it's Gondor. Not a fairly, but it could be Gondor. It's another kingdom. So, but he returns to his kingdom anyway. Yeah? And what he does, he gets crowned. And one, and one of the scenes is either in the extended version or in the cinema version, you see thousands of people kneeling and bowing down to him. And this shows his power, and it also shows how he deserves respect because of this power. Literally thousands of people kneeling down to this king. Now this is what the psalmist is saying here. He's saying God is such an awesome, massive and powerful king. Not only do we come to worship him with music and song and noiseful, joyful noise, we also come to worship him with respect in our hearts. And one of the ways we will show that respect and awe is by kneeling down and bowing towards God. Now, I was speaking to someone the other day and they said to me that when they don't feel like worshipping God, what they do is they, they kneel down before their beds and bow their heads and ask God to help them to worship him. And they said is that the whole kneeling down and bowing really helps them to understand God's awe and reverence. But that's not the only person who else said that to me. They said that to me, well, I read. Jerry Bridges, in his book, Holiness Day by Day, and I'm going to get the quote. It's because I think it's, I, I just need to quote the quote by word by word. This is Jerry Bridges saying, but when we can do so, I strongly recommend bowing before God. Not only as a sign of reference to him, but also for what he does in helping us prepare our minds to worship God in a manner acceptable to him. Jerry Bridges is saying that, this here. He's saying when he doesn't feel like worshipping God, 
He bows his head and kneels so he can come and prepare his mind to worship God. So that's two people who have told me they actually do this act to help him with reverence towards God. And I suppose one of the things I ask myself, and maybe you guys could ask yourselves as well, is do you do that? Do we come before God as part of our worship, kneeling down and bowing to him, which shows respect and reverence to him, which shows his honour and his glory, which shows the true king and creator of the universe he is? Because I've got to admit, I don't usually do that. The way that I pray is either laying down on my bed or walking around, which is nothing wrong with that. But I don't usually bow down and kneel before the God, my maker. And maybe when we're struggling to worship, that's one of the things we can do to help us to worship and be in awe and respect of this great and awesome God. Because it certainly is what the psalmist is calling God's people to do here. So let's carry on. We're going to open this up more. Verse 7. For he is our God. That's, that's amazing, isn't it? So that's just such a small thing in the psalm there. For he is our God. All those who believe and trust in Jesus today, he is our God, this great king, maker of the universe, this king above all kings. And he's their God as well, the people that the psalmist is speaking to. And we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. This is another reason why we should, our hearts should be stirred to worship God, because he cares for us. I preached on Psalm 23 a few months ago, and we went into a lot about a shepherd and what a shepherd does. And here it's the sort of shepherd analogy again. The flock of his pasture, we are the flock under his care. And we saw what a shepherd did for his sheep in ancient Israel. We saw that he protects the sheep, he loves the sheep, he cares for the sheep, and he feeds the sheep. And this is how the shepherd cares for the sheep. And once again, this analogy is being made in this psalm, that God ultimately cares for his people like a shepherd to a sheep. He feeds for them, he cares for them, he protects them, and he nurtures them. He deeply cares for each and every one of us here today. So when the psalmist says, come, let us worship this God, realising and understanding how much God cares for us helps us to to do that and stares our hearts. But do we realise how much God cares for us here today? God cares for us more than our own parents and family do. God cares for us and unlimited times that I can't even explain. And the psalmist puts this in here to show the privileged position of God's people and how much God cares for them, this great king of the universe who created everything. And surely today this should stir our hearts if we realise how much God cares for us to worship him. But let's go on and see what else the psalmist says. Today, if you would only hear his voice, all, hello, what's going on here? I don't know about you, but when I was going through this psalm in my own quiet time, I was thinking it through and I was preparing for this talk. I thought this is a bit of a turn in it in the psalm. Because what we've seen at the moment is how to worship God, coming to worship God, the joyful noise and song, coming to worship the king of the universe and how much he cares for us and how we should worship him with awe and respect. And now it says, if only you would hear his voice. Hello. So the psalmist is now speaking to a people who have a tendency maybe not to hear his voice at times. And hearing his voice is like hearing by obeying God. And look at God's goodness and he's just shown how God is good and how we should come and worship him and how he can fill us with joy and make a joyful noise of him. And now he's saying, come, only if you would hear what I'm saying. Have we been hearing what God has been saying to us this week through his scripture or through other people? Because at times I know that I ain't been hearing what God has been saying to me and I use things in my life to show why I can't hear God at this moment. So this could be speaking to us here as well today if we ain't been hearing which represents obeying God. It's because this is part of worship, a big part of worship. 
obeying God and hearing his voice. Let's see what happens if we continually stop hearing God's voice and not hear it and not obey it. Verse 8. Do not, what? Harden your hearts as they did at Meribah, as you did that day at Massa in the wilderness. What the psalmist is doing, he's doing, as some of you UMP guys will know, maybe a biblical theology, he's going back in history. He's talking about what happened to God's people in history. And they didn't hear God at this place, Meribah and Masha. Sorry, I don't know if I said that properly. And they hardened their hearts. And the psalmist is saying to us and to these people, do not harden your hearts today. Come to worship God instead. Do not harden your hearts. It's a bit like this. I remember when I went and made a fire with my friend years ago when I was a kid. And I was making this fire and I made it really big and I put loads of wood in there. And he came along and started pouring, well not pouring, but throwing water on it, cups of small water. And it kept going out, so I had to throw wood on it to get it back up. And in the end, because I couldn't get the wood quick enough, he just kept throwing water, water, and it just went out. That can represent our hearts to times at God. Our hearts can be on fire for God, wanting to worship God, being stirred for God, loving God. But then they can gradually become hardened. And it says in Hebrews, where this is quoted, by sin's lies or by circumstances in life. And we don't want to worship God or trust and obey him like we used to. So instead of worshipping God, are our hearts becoming hard today? That's a kind of hard question that we need to ask ourselves. And some of the ways, as I just said, that our hearts can become hard is by listening to sin's lies. It's not by encouraging one another in the gospel, not worshipping God both singly and corporately, by allowing life struggles and circumstances to get us down to such a degree that we turn away from God. And many of us here know people who were once Christians and turned away. And that's devastating to see that. But every time I see that, this verse, it's actually the Hebrew, it's quoted in Hebrews, comes up to me and goes, do not harden your hearts, because this could happen to us all today. Now let's have a look on, let's carry on. See, the psalm has taken more of a sombre mood now. Verse 9, where your ancestors tested me, they tried me, though they had seen what I did. So the psalmist is carrying on with the story, and the story is about the first generation Israelites who got saved out of slavery to Egypt into the desert and then were meant to go into the promised land. And these first generation of Israelites saw the massive miracles God did. At that time, Egypt was a superpower. It was a bit like America today. It was a massive superpower. And God totally annihilated it, destroyed its livestock, its economic process and so forth. Just to free his people. He also judged Egypt by killing their firstborn sons. And not only that did the Israelites see that, They saw God part a sea so they could go through it, then bring it back again so it could destroy the enemies who were persecuting God's people. These first generation Israelites that this story is talking about saw the marvellous works of God, but they still hardened their hearts towards God. And not only that, they did not follow his decrees or commands. Ian, they tried him and tested him. Are we doing this today? Are we hardening our hearts so much towards God, despite what he's done for us in our lives? Because many of us here have seen minor miracles or maybe big miracles in our lives that God has done for us. But can we be like these first generation Israelites who harden our hearts, who try God and test God, who complain from not a heart of faith, but complain because they're bitter, and angry because this is a warning to all of us here today so instead of worshipping God we can harden our hearts and test God which is a sombre thing to think about now last two verses for 40 years I was angry with that generation 
I said, they are people whose hearts have gone astray and they have not known my ways. So I declared an oath for my anger. They shall never enter my rest. Now God goes on to show that he was angry at these first generation Israelites and they didn't enter his rest. And we see in Hebrews where this is quoted, it's because of unbelief. They didn't have faith in God to get them to the promised land. These Israelites threw their salvation away. Threw it away. And on a minor level, I'm going to tell you a little analogy now. Over the last couple of months, Arsenal Football Club have been throwing their leads away. They were 3-0 up, they threw it away. They were 2-1 up, they threw it away. It's what they know in football, they're throwing the game away. And I've realised this, that as Christians, as confessing Christians, we can do that. We could throw away our salvation. If we come to church every week and sing the songs, but we don't have a heart of faith towards Jesus, we can throw away our salvation. And we've seen it happen to others. So let's not throw away our salvation and instead worship this great king who commands us to come to him and give a joyful noise to him. But there is good news. It's because as Christians, if we're truly Christians, we won't throw away our salvation. If we truly believe that Jesus died for our sin and rose again, we won't throw it away. Because Jesus said, not one of these little ones will be plucked out my hand. So if we have a true faith in Jesus today, we don't need to be like God's people of old. We can have hardened our hearts. But Jesus has promised us he will get us through that. And his gospel can water that and make our hearts soft. Now many of us here might have had hard hearts this week or over the last month. I might have not been hearing God's voice. Many of us here might not have been worshipping God with joyful noise and so forth. But Jesus has died for that. On the cross 2,000 years ago, he died for our sin of hardness of heart and rose again. And if we truly believe that, we won't be like the first generation Israelites who don't enter God's rest. But one of the ways that we know that we are Christians is that we've been given a new heart and this heart will soften again. And we see some of the ways today of how this heart can be softened by coming to worship God as a family and as individuals. Shouting joyful noise and song, representing, uh, realising his uh, respect and his holiness, coming before him with respect and honour. Understanding his glory in his creation and realising like, wow, this God created all that. And we see in Hebrews other ways, encouraging one another in the gospel, not listening to sin's lies. We see these are all ways to keep our hearts soft instead of hardened. But the big thing we've been looking at here today in this psalm is that let's worship God instead of allowing our hearts to get hardened because that is one of the ways that our hearts can become softer. Now I'm going to pray now and then we're going to worship God together after this. And hopefully it will give you more of a joyous oomph. I'm not saying maybe your personality is not like that, but, you know, but just think, this is one of the ways that God has called us to come to him and experience joy in him. So let's pray together now. Lord, we thank you and praise you for your goodness and your kindness. We thank you for your love and your compassion. We thank you, Lord, that you've called us to worship with joyful noise, song and dancing. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness and love. And Lord, we pray that you protect us from hard hearts today. And one of the ways we do that is by worshipping you as a community, as a family and as individuals. And I pray, Lord, for the rest of this week, you'd be helping us to encourage each other to do that. And I pray, Lord, that you help us to be worshipping you, extolling you, thinking of your greatness and your goodness, Lord. In Jesus' name, Amen.